So our main event tonight, uh, I'd like to introduce Colin Byrne. He's a senior technical advisor in water policy with the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage. He's over 30 years of experience in the water sector. He's worked for a number of other public sector bodies, including the EPA, local authorities, the Inland Fisheries Service. Uh, he's an aquatic engineer by profession, graduated with a PhD from the University College, College Dublin and has postgraduate qualifications in project management and environmental economics. So he's, he's really uh, an ideal example of interdisciplinary expertise in what is a profoundly interdisciplinary topic, which is the, the, the challenges of uh, water generally, both supply of water, use of water, disposal of water, management of water, um, uh, in, in particularly in river, river basins, so the, the River Basin Management Plan uh, lays out the national framework and structure and approach um, at, at a river basin level to many of these topics. So I think it's of keen interest to many members of our division. And so without further ado, I will hand over to Colin in, in the Q&A area. OK, with that, uh, I'll hand over to Colin. Thanks very much. Thank you, Barry, for that introduction. and. Um, Thanks to Engineers Ireland for the opportunity to uh, reach further afield in terms of the River Basin Plan. And we're coming close to the end of the consultation phase. So I'd certainly welcome interest from, from uh, the professionals within, within Engineers Ireland. Um, I think there's plenty for to interest engineers. And I, I've tried to pick out some, some areas because uh, it's not possible to cover the whole River Basin Plan in its totality in, in, within an hour. Uh, so I've, I've kind of cherry picked to a large extent. Um, so if we just move on, Sinead, if you could just move the slides. Uh, the, the draft river basin plan, it's the third plan, uh, was issued for consultation back in September of last year by Minister O'Brien and Minister Noonan. Um, and it's available on our, our website. It closes for consultation at the 31st of March. So that date is uh, coming fast upon us. It's, in fact, it's quite scary how, how quickly six months uh, passes by, it is, but, but there's been a lot of work in the intervening time and we've a few more months before we published the final plan. We anticipate at this stage it'll be probably September uh, of 2022 before we publish the final plan, but there's, a, there's still a lot to be done before we, we do that. Next slide. Um, just to acknowledge, this isn't just a sole solo run on, on behalf of the Water Division and Department of, of, of Housing. Uh, it's a culmination of the input of a lot of different organizations and individuals, um, other government departments, state bodies, representative bodies like on Fora Mishka. Um, so you can see um, the, the, the list of organizations there. And, and when the presentation is, is uh, circulated, you, you, you can look at that in, in a bit more detail. But needless to say, it incorporates a significant input from a lot of people. Um, we just move. Yeah. So just in terms of the, the actual structured draft plan, and, and many of you may have already general introductions, just setting out the, the requirements of the Water Framework Directive. Um, and then our river basin plan is described in, in, in detail. And then there's um, an assessment of our water resources, effectively the status of those water bodies nationally, um, and also the, the risks the, the, to, to those water bodies. Um, and, and that's largely based on technical work undertaken by the EPA, but with input from, from many organizations. There is also then an initial assessment of the second cycle plan. Um, and interestingly, by the middle of this year, EPA plan on publishing a water quality report for the entire second cycle. So that really will set the tone for the third cycle. It'll be basically the baseline assessing where we've managed to get to the second cycle. Um, informally, EPA are saying back to us that we they, they are seeing uh, some improvements. Um, the results are being worked through, but we're, we're, we're hopeful that we're, we're, we're seeing the early signs of, of water quality improvements, which is contrary to the the the, um, the trends uh, prior to that. So we think this is reflecting the more targeted approach that we've taken uh, during the second cycle. And we hope to build on that and do more targeting, increase our level of ambition and, and spread 
um, and and um, you know actually show significant improvements in the third cycle. But I'll come back to that. Then the heart of the document really is to propose programs of measures, how we plan to protect, but also restore our water bodies. And uh, we'll come back to this in a bit more detail. In, in certain days, then the first is just um, set as to what the require the requirements of the directive are, and cross tabulating that to to um, the, the the draft plan and the elements of the draft plan sorry, to Colin, make it sorry. easier to um, so, digest. Sorry. Yes, Colin, sorry, I'm, I'm, can just, you hear me? I'm just I'm just going to break in there. We're, we're just having sure. a slight break up on the audio, so I will suggest you switch off your video, and hopefully that'll go a bit better. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay, and, and please come in again if, if there's still problems, no doubt you will. Um, yeah, just in terms of the programs of measures, they're kind of dispersed through the documents, so they've been kind of pulled together in this tabular form at, at the back, just to make it easier reference. Um, and then there's a list of areas for action. And as I said, our, our ambition has increased from the priority areas of our action to the second cycle to uh, a much more uh, comprehensive um, uh, Ambition, if you like. Next slide, please. So you might just ask where we are compared to the rest of, of Europe. Um, regarding the public consultation on the draft plan, all member states were late, be largely because of, of COVID. Um, all the yellow con countries are those which have just concluded a, their consultation, uh, most of them by the end of, of last year. Uh, we're in the second bunch. We're still, we have the, the consultation is ongoing. Um, but that will have changed by the end of, of this month. So we will join the, the, the vast bulk of member states. There's another, a couple of member states um, and new member states who, who have yet to start the consultation. Next slide, please. Okay, so the river, the, the river basin plan and the measures are intended to address the most significant pressures on, on our waters. And they are not surprisingly agriculture being the most extensive, uh, given that it's it's the most widespread land use. So that, that comes as no surprise to anybody. Um, and there's real challenges here, and I'll come back to that. And a, a comprehensive approach is really uh, warranted. Hydromorphology, which is the physical condition of uh, water bodies. Um, we, we knew that this was a, a significant issue, but we've been probably a little bit um, taken aback with just the extent. And that's really on the back of better technical information, better monitoring information. So this is a real issue that we're going to have to tackle in a serious way. And we're talking about drainage. We're talking about barriers on rivers. Um, forestry then as well. And while the policy has certainly strengthened in the area of forestry over the last number of years, there is an issue around compliance and implementation of those policies. Urban wastewater. Um, figures largely um, and now we have Irish water in place which brings a kind of a discipline and, and a coherence and a consistency to addressing urban wastewater discharges so we expect significant improvements over the next few years and I'll come back to this. Urban runoff is another area which hasn't received sufficient attention in the past. We're talking about um, sustainable urban drainage type systems, surface runoff, um, drainage uh, runoff in, in, into rivers, etc. And while there's policies there, the actual implementation has, has has not been effective. So we need to address that, and I'll come back to that briefly uh, later on. Next slide, please. Next slide. So I'll just go into the programs of measures, and before I do, um, pick out a number of, of key pressures. Just some of the key considerations we've had um, in preparing the draft plan. The first is the high level of ambition that's set out in the program for government. And that's right across the environmental sphere. Climate clearly is getting a lot of attention, um, biodiversity and water. But needless to say, they're all interrelated. And many of the measures we'd be looking at to improve water quality um, will also provide benefits to climate and the biodiversity. So we're, we're very much attempting to, to have a much more integrated approach in dealing with these issues. We've tried um, now to set quantitative targets where we can for the deployment of measures. And I, I, I hopefully I'll illustrate this effectively later on. 
So we're now looking at the scale of measures that we need to put in place for, to deal with, for instance, for agriculture um, and hydromorphology. The updated characterization and risk assessment uh, that EPA have undertaken with the support of many authorities over the last couple of years really is, is guiding um, the approach that we're taking. We've been mindful of the lessons from the implementation of the last two river basin uh, plans and, and taking those lessons and, and, and applying them to uh, the de development of the, the, the new program. We've also considered the feedback from various consultations in the, in the river basin planning process. There's the significant water management issues uh, consultation, which happened two years ago. Um, and we had 170 submissions on that, quite substantial submissions. We're expecting a very strong interest um, and response to the draft plan at the end of March as well. Um, and also the scientific base has developed quite considerably, so much so that we now have an evidence base which will allow us to target the right measure in the right place. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, later on. Next slide, please. Um, I mentioned that we are very much focused on delivering integrated multi-policy objectives for water, for biodiversity and climate where possible. And on Forum Ishka um, has developed what they call film concepts, or which is a the framework for integrated land and land use management. And we think what we're proposing responds to, to, to that call for a more integrated approach. There's also a need to look at the evolving governance and implementation structures. As the needs change, the structures for implementing those, those changes um, also um, need to be modified. And with that in mind, there's a number of reviews that have taken place or are in the process of, of, of being completed. One is of local authority uh, water environment function. Uh, there's the local authority's water program as well, which has been reviewed. And the agricultural sustainability and support advisory program is also being reviewed. Largely looking at um, the scale of measures we want to put in place and how the kind of supporting structures and resources to, to, to implement that. So it, it's a bit of a, an, an iterative process. We also recognize that there's a need to increase environmental enforcement where compliance is, is low. Um, I'm particularly thinking here in terms of agricultural um, regulation we know from inspections from the local authorities and, and uh, Department of Agriculture, compliance levels are poor. So there is a renewed focus on doubling down our efforts in terms of environmental enforcement. And I'll come back to this under the heading of, of agriculture. We've also looked for opportunities to strengthen the links between the Water Framework Directive and other regulatory processes. And in my mind, I'm thinking of uh, the, the planning legislation as well. And indeed, there's um, planning guidelines which will be put out for public consultation um, the middle of this year. It's just we're going through the strategic environmental assessment process at the minute. But the consultation will take place the middle of this year on that guidance. There are also a number of areas where we need to replace outdated and efficient regulatory regimes with more comprehensive robust and streamlined regimes. Um, and I'm particularly thinking here in terms of the whole area of hydromorphology, physical infrastructure development in or close to water bodies. Um, it's quite fragmented um, and that's due to legacy issues. So we need to comprehensively review and revise the, 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 um, the regulatory regime here, regime here. Next slide, please. Um, does the implementation structures which oversee the implementation of the plan. And they consist of a, a water policy advisory committee, which advises the minister on various issues. That's supported by a national coordination management committee led by my own department and local authorities. Really the project management element, you know, kind of watching progress and taking um, corrective action as, as required. At the coal phase then there's the local authority structures um, with various regional committees, five regional committees. They're supported by a number of state bodies. And then also there's the local authorities water program, which is a, a shared service. There's also the National Water Forum, which is a, a, a statutory body made up of various uh, stakeholder groups. 
There's the National Technical Implementation Group chaired by EPA, which oversees various technical um, uh, work packages. The IPA have implemented a research project looking at water governance and looking at OECD water governance principles with a view to holding a lens, if you like, into, over these structures and, and seeing how they are being effective or not effective and how they need to evolve and develop. So we see this as an evolving process and, and, and a, a, a trying and, and learning and adapting type, type of scenario. So that IPA research project is really important in that regard. Next slide. So this is the kind of table of contents in terms of the programs of measures. I'm not going into, into these in, in, in any great detail. I'll, I'll come back to a few of them. But they cover things like agriculture, uh, hydromorphology, forestry, urban wastewater, urban runoff, domestic wastewater systems, um, peat, industrial discharges, drinking water source protection, invasive alien species, hazardous chemicals in the environment, the water environment, aquaculture, and land use planning. Next slide, please. So I'll, I'll focus in on, on two or three uh, key areas. Um, as I mentioned, agriculture is the most significant pressure in waters, as you could see from that earlier graph. There's two main responses to agriculture. The first is better regulation, and we have the Nitrates Action Program, uh, which is in place. That's just been reviewed. We have new regulations, which will be signed by the minister probably Monday or Tuesday of next week. Um, controls have been tightened quite significantly um, on the back of declining water quality and the increase in nitrogen uh, levels. And that's really on the back of, of dairy expansion, uh, which is a, a serious concern. There's um, a significant target of reducing nitrogen loss to water by 50%. We are putting in place tighter controls and nitrogen inputs using targeted load reductions. Um, a chemical fertilizer register is being established by the Department of Agriculture by early next year. And this will give us a means of controlling uh, or certainly seeing the level of fertilizer use at farm level. Um, and then that gives us the ability to make sure that fertilizer um, applications are not exceeding what is legally um, restricted. Um, and we, we have a, a means then of dialing down fertilizer input. So that will make a big difference. We need to improve an enforcement uh, with a view to increasing compliance. And I'll come back to this in the next slide. On the other side, there's the kind of support mechanisms. And as, as many of you may be aware, that the cap has now been reviewed. Um, strategic plans have been submitted to Europe, including from Ireland. And there's quite a ground shift in the focus now. Rather than paying farmers just for undertaking changes, it's about changing the focus to reward farmers for delivering environmental outcomes and that's something that we've advocated uh, with, with various government bodies and, and agencies to see this significant refocus so that we're seeing the right measure being put in the right place and that farmers are being rewarded for that and delivering outcomes it's very much based on multiple objectives as well multiple benefits for water climate and, and biodiversity uh, so we're seeing a shift towards results-based payments um, and there's the, environment, the EIP program, innovative program under CAP, which is being used very successfully on a pilot basis. That now needs to be upscaled and is being upscaled in a significant way. And it will involve 50,000 farmers. EPA have done a gap analysis, estimating the extent of measures required in relation to agriculture for restoring waters. For instance, on a cumulative basis, they've identified points along rivers where interception measures to stop pollutants being flowing into to waters um, needs to be uh, put in place. Cumulatively, that's about two and a half thousand kilometers or 3% of our, our national network. So all of a sudden, it's a much more achievable target, albeit that it represents many, many points. If that was to be tackled, for instance, through native woodlands, it could amount to 12 and a half thousand hectares, small stands of, of, of woodlands. So all of a sudden, this thing is now a, a more, more um, uh, uh, realistic sort of um, challenge. EPA also indicates that if a minimum of 20,000 hectares of organic soils were re-wetted in the right place, this will have a significant beneficial effect on water quality. Next slide, please. 
I mentioned the importance of enforcement. Uh, we're aware that the level of non-compliance is high among farmers, and you'll see the, the, the pie chart there, the types of non-compliances we're seeing. Um, in the area of slurry storage, uh, we're seeing 40% of dairy farms do not have sufficient sl slurry storage, and you can imagine the, the environmental impact of that. So that's clearly not acceptable, and we need to tighten up controls and make sure that, that those farms are being compliant. So what you will see now is a much more risk-based, targeted approach to uh, enforcement and compliance. The European Commission we've been negotiating with over the last months have a clear focus on this as well, and they want to see better enforcement, as do we. Um, so we're now looking at resources to uh, provide to local authorities um, to undertake that, that enforcement. Cross-reporting will be really important, and this is where local authorities carry out inspections, they find a non-compliance, there's a legal obligation to cross-report that to the Department of Agriculture, and then financial penalties will be implemented um, where, where needed. And that we could expect to be quite effective in terms of um, achieving compliance. But of course, there's also a need to increase awareness and training among farmers that, that they're fully aware of what their obligations are in terms of the environmental laws. So that there's an aspect of that that needs to be implemented. Next slide, please. Um, this whole issue of the right measure in the right place is going to be really important and making sure that you know we effectively ap apply our resources. EPA have now developed what are called pollution and impact potential maps, which at the field level, identify points along rivers, and these are the, the red dots that you you you, you see there, uh, where you there are kind of preferential flow paths where you get heavy rainfall, and the the rainfall um, you got the surface runoff runs along these orange areas and in at these points, and then obviously there's the potential to carry pollutants with them. Um, so the challenge really is to intercept those most significant red dots and put in place either buffer zones or maybe stands of trees or maybe retention ponds or whatever. And that's the challenge. Um, and that's, you know, we're talking about nature-based type solutions and uh, being put in at field level. And I'll come back to measures that are being implemented to, uh, to, to help us to do this at, at local level. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, for, for Agriculture to be dealt with effectively, we need a comprehensive approach. So there's the, the, the strengthened nitrates regulations, um, which you see in the top top line there, which will have benefit in ter terms of control nitrates, phosphates, pathogens, and all the rest of it. But then you've got the CAP strategic plan, you've got conditionality, um, you've got the eco schemes, you've got the new agro-environmental schemes as well, which cumulatively, if these are all effectively implemented, will deliver significant outputs you know but it's how we organize ourselves to deliver on this and there is significant coordination happening to try and make this this happen in for real next slide please this is a map generated by the epa showing where measures for phosphorus and silt the blue areas are required uh, based on um various risk factors and then the or orange areas are where you got say free draining draining soils uh, where nitrogen getting the groundwater from application of nitrogen to, to land, whether it be slurries or chemical fertilizers, is a real issue. So we now have a better means of identifying where we need to focus, for instance, our, our enforcement activities. Uh, so I'd, I'd anticipate quite strong enforcement of these orange areas to make sure that uh, the regulations are being complied with. The blue areas are where um, agro-environmental measures could be implemented, putting in, in place interception measures, for instance. So that will be our focus over the, the next couple of months, trying to design schemes that, that respond and implement measures in, in these areas. Next slide, please. On to hydromorphology, which um, to those of you who aren't familiar with the, with, with the term, it's effectively the physical condition of water bodies. And that means it's the flow regime, it's the substrate, um, it's the continuity. If you look at this uh, picture here, it's Ardna Crusha. Um, you can imagine that, that that has effectively changed what was a, a flowing river into a, a lake. So the ecology is very different. 
the continuity has been severely disrupted, affecting natural processes, um, probably most importantly, fish migration. You know, so we have to address these. There's an obligation under the Water Framework Directive to address this, improve fish migration, for instance. We've got the biodiversity strategy now, which was published last year, which again has a strong mandate to improve, uh, open up rivers right across the country. So the kind of pressures we're talking about here are drainage, both land drainage, but also channel drainage, barriers such as Ardna Crusha, but also even low structures such as weirs, culverts, that type of thing. And then any engineering works in or close to um, to 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 uh, work water bodies. And as I mentioned, this is the most second most prevalent and significant pressure. But it's a new pressure that we we've only really started to understand the the, the true impact. Um, and it's it's a new challenge. Next slide, please. So what does the directive require us to do when it comes to hydromorphology? Well, in terms of future developments. Uh, we need to control it to make sure that there's no further deterioration. And the new water and planning guidance will be really important in terms of um, providing that control and making sure we don't have deterioration and, and we have proper mitigation and put in place. In the case of natural water bodies, we must protect and enhance where required um, and, and restore. Where waters have been heavily modified, such as Ardna Crusha, where a water body is no longer, for instance, a river, it's more like a lake, we have to protect and enhance those water bodies without impacting on the, the, the beneficial use that, 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 that it has. Where there are protected interests, uh, such as Natura sites, we must also achieve compliance with their water requirements. And we have to adopt under Article 4 necessary measures to uh, deliver uh, good status when it comes to hydromorphology. And then there's a specific requirement under Article 11 to control um, activities which are impacting on hydromorphology. Next slide, please. So you might ask, are the controls in place sufficient? Um, at the moment, in the in the uh, development consent, or development um, the planning system, we have the environmental impact assessment, which should be picking up these things. Um, there's the arterial drainage, the the good practice that. OPW have developed with fisheries over the years, but it's non-regulatory and, and that, that's a problem. There's land drainage, which the Department of Agriculture controls under the agricultural EIA regulations for 2011, but we know from reports that that's not being complied with. There's a lot of activity out there that's not being referred to the Department of Agriculture, and there are also some gaps that need to be addressed. So are they adequate? Well, they might be partly, um, but they were never, these regimes were never designed to deal with WFD. So they don't go far enough effectively and deeper structural legislative change is needed. Next slide. So the nature of the task ahead is, is, to, is recognizing that the existing body of legislation, it's disparate, it's complicated. It has been heavily amended in the past and it's not fit for purpose. Um, and that's not surprising, it was created in an era when environmental objectives were secondary to, to other um, national objectives and priorities. So we recognize that there's a need to, to uh, revise the regulatory regime. And during this, the second cycle, which we're, we're now at the end of, that was the end of 2021, there's been various technical preparatory work being done. So now we need to move forward and develop a clear and rigorous control regime one that's consistent in terms of assessments um, and that we have clear guidance for, for various uh, bodies, regulatory bodies, but also uh, for developers. Um, and there must be provision for adequate uh, public participation, which is a requirement of the Water Framework Directive. Next slide, please. So there's been preparatory work being undertaken, as I mentioned, um, and this includes um, improvements to assessment tools that EPA have been leading over the last number of years. I, Inland Fisheries Ireland have developed a national inventory of barriers and that will form the cornerstone of a restoration program to deal with legacy issues. Um, they've identified 73,000 structures, but those posing risk may be somewhere between two and 7,000. Still a significant number, but something a bit more manageable. And that will take a number of cycles to address effectively. 
there's a roadmap being developed to improve fish migration around the Cush and Partine, and a really nice piece of work done by uh, CDM Smith on behalf of, um, of, of the department. And we expect that to be announced in, in the coming weeks. There's the statutory water and planning guidance, which I mentioned earlier as well. Um, we've reviewed the drainage legislation and, and again, have identified weaknesses that need to be addressed. There's a national water retentions, uh, water retention measures group, which has been progressing various measures or guidance in terms of um, mitigation measures. And there was a recent technical review of heavy modified water bodies, which EPA has undertaken, and that will go to consultation in the next in the uh, next few weeks. Next slide, please. So the proposed way forward for hydromorphology is um, proposals for a new bill uh, for to underpin a new regime um, and supporting secondary legislation, establishing a new control act activities regime for for all those activities. Um, and also recognizing the legacy of structures that are there decades and even a century or more old, uh, a national hydromorphology restoration program must be put in place. Next slide. So the next steps then are to plan for the development of a new regulatory regime, and that includes legislation, administrative design, and also technical supporting work uh, all being done in parallel. And um, we're in the process of establishing a national hydromorphology expert group to, to help and advise the minister as to how to do that. Next slide, please. Um, on to then wastewater um, and clearly the continued and increased investment of Irish water um, and in rural water services is, is really important and there's unprecedented uh, investment being undertaken. Um, and we could out, you know, it's not all about money, there is capacity to actually deliver. So we, we have to pedal to the floor really in terms of trying to deliver what we can as, in a sustainable way. And Irish Water's presence on, on, on the scene now brings a coherence uh, to, to that entire process. Our priority at the moment is adherence to the urban wastewater uh, infringement case against Ireland. And we're moving towards full compliance within the next three to four years. So if we look at what's happened over the last couple of years, in 2017, we had 172 large urban areas and 28 of these were non-compliant uh, at that stage. And that's now fallen to 19 and is, is uh, declining steadily. So we expect compliance within the next three to four years in that, with that. Next slide, please. There's the area of um, urban runoff as well. Um, and want water sensitive urban design. And these are pressures such as direct surface discharges to water and stormwater overflows from combined sewers. Um, and while there's policies among a lot of authorities, local authorities in terms of SUDs, it's not really being effectively implemented. So a number of actions have been undertaken. The first being to develop recommendations for an implementation strategy for nature-based sustainable urban drainage systems on a national scale. Um, a scoping exercise has been carried out and we expect over the next couple of months, resources to be put in place to develop that strategy. In the intervening time, there was a call for interim guidance for local authorities, and that has been developed over the last couple of months um, and it, is, it was published um, uh, about two months ago. Next slide, please. So I mentioned the the Ambition level has been increased um, and you can see the coverage here. These are different initiatives which, which are being undertaken. And really it's about trying to maximize the benefit from all of these uh, initiatives such as EIPs, Interreg, Rivers Trust where they're active um, and then local authorities water program um, where it is also active. So we're looking at measures to restore, protect uh, water bodies and we're in discussions in terms of uh, providing resources to, to to do that. Next slide, please. So when we talk about level of ambition for the third cycle, uh, as I said, the river, the program for government sets a high level of ambition. And we're in the process of trying to identify exactly what water quality improvements we can expect uh, during the next cycle. But before we do that, we need to consider a number of factors. The first is the scale of measures required. As I say, we now, for the first time, have a reasonable picture of what's required in terms of agricultural measures, for instance, and hydromorphology. Um, there's the technical capacity available to implement measures. So 
it's not all about funding. You have to have the capacity to deliver. So Irish Water, for instance, can only deliver at a certain rate because there's planning, there is a very appropriate assessment where it's required, um, and then there's the actual uh, delivery of works. So that all has to be taken into account. There's the practical steps, the legislative process that need to be considered. I say there's the planning process, implementation, and, and, and all that comes with that. There's also the feedback from the river basin consultation process, which will finish at the end of, of, um, of this month. And then we're also looking at a financial strategy to implement these measures. Again, looking at the cumulative, the, the sort of integrated approach where we're, we're delivering measures which are going to deliver for multiple policy objectives in the environmental sphere, climate, water, biodiversity, for instance. And it's only then that taking all these factors into account that will ultimately dictate the timelines over which measures will be delivered. Next slide, please. So next, the last slide here is just um, coming back to where we're at. Uh, we're early March now. The consultation started in September. There's been a, a hive of activity, uh, largely led by local authorities, the local authorities water program uh, throughout the country. There's a, a lot of interest in the plan consultation closes at the end of, of this month and uh, we welcome any any inputs so 